when you're talking about student teaching and everything you need to know about being a music teacher. Uh, Matt Nordhausen is a prominent percussionist and educator in the Greater Rochester area. He graduated from SUNY Fredonia with degrees in music education and conducting. He currently teaches at Leroy Central Schools. And fun fact, he was my band teacher um, starting when I was in fifth grade. He taught me how to play the Rainbow Connection. Um, I got him a tie that has drumsticks on it, but like not drumsticks like the, the instrument, the, the chicken variety of drumsticks. Um, still I'm glad, I'm glad. Um, and I've, I've also known him since he had hair all the way on the top of his head. Um, but without further ado, <laughs> um, I have the pleasure of introducing Mr. Matt Nordhausen. That's awesome and totally fair. Um, so, uh, yeah, Katie, I have known for many years, and it was just this morning that I found out that she was going to be the person introducing me, and I just, that was, that was awesome, it was exciting. Uh, so cool to, to watch careers come full circle, uh, you know, where your students are, you know, out there in the field and teaching as well, or performing, or music business, or whatever avenue it is. It's also cool and a little bit sobering to uh, start teaching uh, students now that are the kids of the kids that I taught. So I've reached that point. I know, I know you're shocked as I am. I know I only look like I'm 20, I get it. But uh, that's okay, you can laugh, it's good. Uh, so anyway, let, just to show of hands, I wanna see who's in the room here today. How many veteran teachers, like maybe 10 plus years? We got 10 plus years up the front, okay. Not very many, that's good. I love, yeah, well, all right. Well, old people rock, okay, here we go. Uh, how about maybe five to ten years in? You're, you're five, ten years in. There we go, Tasha's in. Uh, I got some plants up front apparently here. Uh, so, and uh, how, how about the, the new people? How about you do your one, two, three years into the job? I love it. This is awesome. You're still in the job. That's great. All right, you didn't get scared away yet. And how many of you are in college? You're pursuing, you're getting ready, you're excited. Look at this. This is so cool. Awesome. My people, I love it. Um, all right, well, I've been teaching at the Leroy Central School District for uh, 20 years or so now. Uh, I graduated from SUNY Fredonia, as, uh, as Katie uh, talked about there. Loved my time there, and I'm very, very happy with how they prepared me for the music side of being a teacher, uh, as most colleges and universities will. They're gonna teach you how to conduct and how to really master that craft of your instrument and your secondary instruments. If you're an instrumental person, I hope you're really working on your secondary instruments. It's crucial. You know, your piano, your guitar, all of those things. All of that's wonderful. But there's this whole other side to teaching, and that's the business side, and it is a business. This is still a job. You have a contract, you have all of these uh, all this uh, educational component stuff that is not just being in front of your kids and teaching them how to play the scale and the notes and the rhythms and all that stuff. All of that's important, but knowing how the job works can be even more important. I remember a college professor back when I was in college told me, he said, Matt, unfortunately, you don't get fired for being a bad teacher. And he was absolutely right. Uh, we all know some teachers that probably shouldn't be. However, he said, you get fired for screwing up the business side of things, screwing up money, uh, making mistakes you know, with programs or something like that, or over-programming. I was that guy, first year out of college, thought I knew it all, like, yes, I am the master teacher, I have all this, and, and I had a great first year, and my kids could play super well, they were awesome, and I'm like, well, then I'm stepping it up for year number two. That was a mistake. And then all of a sudden, year number two, program wasn't so hot, and here I am in front of my principal going, uh, you know, and him going, what was that? Why Why did that sound like that? What was going on? And, and, and when those mistakes happen, oh, no, okay, I did. I said, yeah, that was me. I overshot the ensemble. I got excited. I thought they could handle all this stuff, and yeah, you know, maybe seventh graders shouldn't be doing Salvation is Creative, you know? <laughs> Whoops. Um, so... Uh, anyway, you know, that's okay, and you can make those mistakes, but my goal here today is to hopefully help you avoid some of those same pitfall, pitfalls and mistakes that maybe I made or know about, and uh, I've been having student teachers now since 2007 from Roberts, Nazareth, Fredonia, uh, I think maybe Ithaca, I don't remember, um, but it's been a great time. I'm on uh, student teacher number 20 right now, with, uh, Mr. Michael Denice, if anybody knows Mike from Nazareth. Um, and it's cool. It's, I, I love it. I see some uh, former student teachers in the room as well. Jeremiah Cooper. He wasn't with me. He was with another uh, person in our district, but 
took advantage, and here's a big one, if you've not student taught yet, or maybe you are student teaching right now and it's not too late, get outside of just your cooperating teacher. Jeremiah is a perfect example. I hope you don't mind, I'm calling you out on this one. But Jeremiah was with a guy in our district, Dan DeLuca, and he was focusing primarily on general music. But uh, Jeremiah was in my band rehearsal and the beginner band rehearsals uh, every single time. He didn't have to do that. That meant he was coming into school an hour earlier than what his contract time was. But that was cool, and he was getting that additional experience and knowledge because you don't know exactly what job you're going to be applying for and what you're going to get. Our, our degrees all say, you know, K through 12 or pre-K or whatever it is now, strings, instrumental, vocal, doesn't matter, and you don't know what you're going to get. Now, hopefully you can, you know, cherry pick and pick exactly the job you want and you fall into that, and that's wonderful. But since you don't know, try to get as much experience as possible when you're in that student teaching. But anyway, um, let's let's jump. That was kind of a, an aside right now. Uh, up here is a QR code if you want to be all technologically savvy and all that and scan it. Hopefully my session packet came up. Did it work? All right, we got some nods. Yes, I didn't screw up technology too badly. Um, if you do want a hard copy of the packet, I went old school and uh, wasted trees and money, sorry. Uh, but if you'd like one of those, you can come up and get a full hard copy packet of everything that we're going to go up on the screen or that you have on your screens as well. Um, so, let's move forward, shall we? Um, so, we already talked a little bit about myself, but hey, there I am. Um, there's uh, me in a nutshell there. I've got my awesome colleagues on the right-hand side over Lori, who are also over here. Uh, Tasha and Jackie, and we're actually presenting tomorrow, too, about being a really cool unified team and unit. And we've got marching band staff, Scott Wheeler is here, too. Um, I'm a percussionist by trade, that's my main instrument. I love to ski, I love the bills, love the Mets, I love the golf. Um, I love my students, they're awesome. Bottom right corner there, they're great kids, we have a good time. Uh, and I'm a big marching arts guy too. Uh, I've run the Leroy Marching Man program as either the director or the assistant director for 20 years. I was also the director of Hilton's program. So I'm a local guy, I'm from Rochester. Uh, I'm a Hilton graduate as well, if anybody's from this area. So anyway. Let's move forward. Oh, beginnings and endings. So it begins. Um, it sounds a little down at the beginning, but it's true. Literally, if one thing in 20 years that I've learned is that everything is about beginnings and endings. Our, our world, us, starts with a birth and a death. Sorry to be morbid, but that's how it works, right? Beginnings and endings. Interviews. Your career is going to start with an interview. It's going to end with your retirement. And by the way, those interviews, it's going to, you, don't, you have no idea what connections you're making in college right now. True story, when I was hired at Leroy, the superintendent was a wonderful woman named M.J. Brook. M.J. Brook happened to have been my middle school and high school principal when I was a student. Thank God I was not a bad kid or something like that. I was a kid that got remembered for good things, especially since I have red hair and stick out in the crowd, albeit less these days. But, um, you know, I already created an impression with MJ Brooke without ever realizing what that was going to play for me in the future. Now, that's a unique scenario, but you don't know. So here I am looking for a job. I'm 22 years old, graduated from college, and I, I hear about this opening in Leroy, of which I've never even heard of this district or this town, and I'm even from this area. But I call up the district, and this woman, MJ Brooke, answers the phone. And I'm like, no way, it's got to, I mean, what, what are the odds? It's like, how many MJ Brooks in school administration could there be? And sure enough, it's her, it's MJ Brooke. Now I'm about to introduce my MJ or Miss Brooke, this is Matt Nordhausen, I graduate. She remembered everything about, oh, Matt, good to hear from you. What, you graduated in 98, and boy, you're still, you went into music. I'm like, this is pre-Facebook, by the way, okay, or Instagram or anything. This is pre-MySpace, okay? So, um... You know, it was awesome, and thank God I had already created that amazing impression upon her. So beginnings and endings, you don't know where that's going to go. Hopefully I'm making a good first impression on you guys right now, uh, or you're walking out the side curtain there. I don't know, we'll find out. But anyway, um, then you want to get into specific music. What you're going to be doing as a tactician, that's what you are. You're a tactician up on that podium, uh, or in that general music classroom, or whatever. You're working on beginnings and endings, attacks and releases. Um, I just came from the chorus choral concerts over in the uh, in the hall there, Church for Chila and Wayne. Great jobs by both groups. I loved their programming, what pieces they started with, what pieces they ended with, what they did in the middle. 
Like I said, I do marching band. You program your show that way. You want a strong opener, then you hit your ballad, your percussion feature, big closer. Like all of these things matter. So when you're programming your concerts, you're gonna wanna have that strong opening, then your middle, then your break, and you're gonna wanna make sure your best pieces are the first piece and the last piece, okay? Stuff in the middle is forgotten and forgiven, but what you end with is what they remember, okay? What you start with is how you grab their attention and keep it, or don't, and lose it. So all that, phrases, warming up and cooling down, that's why we do that as instrumentalists and vocalists, right? We don't hopefully just jump right into practicing. No, you know, as a percussionist, I grab my heavier drumsticks like an MLB player on the on-deck circle, putting the extra weights on the bat, and I work out my wrists and my forearms, and I get ready, and then I go in. So there's a warm-up, there's a cool-down at the end, beginnings and endings. Your concert opener, as I talked about, enters and exits. Um, all of that, stories, screenplays, movies, anything with a story, right? You have your, your beginning, your intro, your setting, your setup, and your story comes through, and then you have to have that big ending. The movie's the same thing. It's all the same. Literally, everything comes down to beginnings and endings. So I just want you to think about that in terms of your career and in terms of the macro, right? But in terms of the micro, your everyday teaching, it's all about beginnings and endings as well. All right, let's move on. Boom. Um, okay, speaking of beginnings, when should you start your career? This is probably the number one question that my student teachers ask me. They say, should I go right into you know public school education, if that's what they are, you know, public school educators that want to be, or should I get my master's degree? I will preface, what I'm giving you today is not necessarily facts. It's opinions, it's based on my experiences of 20 years and things of that nature. You take what applies to you or what will possibly apply to you. You can leave the rest of the wayside. In my opinion, I highly recommend getting the job first. Here's why. Two main reasons. One, you may not really know what you're going to master in or what you should master in. I was considering going right on to my master's after my undergraduate, and I was going to continue on in percussion performance. Okay, that would have been great. Go get my master's in percussion performance, and I could become an even more amazing percussionist. Whoa. That would not help my students, right? I mean, I teach. I'm a really cool thing. We've got a, a vertical teaching um, practice at Leroy where starting in seventh grade, we have three instrumental teachers, and we purposely hired a brass person, a percussion person, and a woodwind person so that we could teach vertically. So I get to teach all percussionists fourth grade through twelfth grade. And my percussionists by twelfth grade, if they've listened and practiced and tried and all that stuff, end up being pretty dang good. A number of them go on into college music. I've a couple play all over the world and things like that. Me going and getting a master's in percussion performance would not have benefited them anymore. It just wouldn't have. It would have benefited me personally, but that isn't a goal of mine and hasn't been for 20 years. I'm not looking to become some phenomenal percussionist. I like playing for area shows and musicals and cover bands when I have time, but I don't need a master's degree to do that. So I'm glad I waited, because after my first year, or while I was teaching in my first year, I discovered, you know what I could use that would benefit my job, my kids, and everything like that? Conducting. I already liked conducting. I could do it. I could wave my arms, all that good stuff. But I really wanted to delve into score study and baton technique and uh, skills and developments. And that made immediate improvement to my ensemble. So that's what I decided then to get my master's degree in. It was more applicable and helpful and immediately could be used with my students and my program to better their lives, which is the goal, right? That's why we're there. We're trying to better their lives. We're already good, <laughs> okay? Second reason. Money. How many of you have debt from college? Yep. Okay. I was just talking to a gentleman yesterday, uh, 48 years old. He's a school counselor where my, my two children go to school. He just finished pay, paying off his college debt. 48. I've got my best friend in the world, tuba player, teaches here in Rochester. He will die in debt, I swear. Between his master's and his undergrad, he I think he's... Well, he's my age, so mid-40s, and he still has $70,000 in debt. Isn't that crazy? Because he went to a private school. So I love the shock faces, because here's why. Get your job first. I can't tell you how many districts, and it's many of them, will either reimburse you for your master's, will pay for your master's, or will bump up your salary once you get the master's. And if you can get rid of debt or not accurate in the first place, why wouldn't you? 
Life is expensive. Homes through the roof right now, right? Okay, all those things. Rent is expensive. Cars are expensive. Gas is expensive. Everything's expensive. You guys know you're living. You're in that. So if you can get a district that'll pay for it, why wouldn't you? My wife teaches in Greece. Not a music teacher. That's why we're still married. Um, so, <laughs> so she, uh, Greece, the Greece Central School District right here in Rochester, they paid 100% of her master's degree no matter where she wanted to go. So she went to NAS for free. How awesome is that? Private school tuition for a master's degree. That's tens of thousands of dollars that we didn't have to pay, which is why we don't have any debt anymore. I went to Fredonia still because Leroy, my district, reimburses me, or did back then, and they reimbursed at the SUNY rate. So there's two differences. Now, I did have to pay out of pocket for that, so I only took as many courses as I could afford at the time, but then I was getting paid back right away. Why wouldn't I do that? So in my opinion, go get the job first. Here's the third reason that's unique to you guys right now if you're in college. Um, <laughs> strike while the iron is hot. When I applied for my job 20 years ago, there were 400 applicants. I beat up 399 other people. My colleagues over here, when Jackie applied for her job, I, I think we went through about 200 applicants. And that was about seven or eight years after me. Absolutely. Now we get down, to, I didn't even know I was gonna do this, but since you're here. I promise. Yeah. <laughs> Tasha is phenomenal. She would have beaten out 400 people, but there weren't. There were about what? 10, 15? You told me 60. We lied. <laughs> Why did you feel good? We lied. No, seriously, Tasha is amazing and we're so happy. But 20 years ago, 400 applicants for one job. Right now, 15, 20. We just hired a gentleman two years ago. There were about five. I'm not making this up. If you have a pulse and you're a halfway decent musician, you're gonna get the job. And I'm sorry to say that because we want better than that, but that's the reality. So go get the job right now because you're gonna have your pick depending on your location and if you wanna move and things like that. Or maybe not even. But I mean, that's just crazy. 400 applicants 20 years ago, nobody to them. So go get your job, make them pay for your masters. And I don't know, to me, that's a no brainer, but you know. You guys do you, but there's that information. All right, bam, moving on. Oh, by the way, if anybody has any questions about any of these topics at any point in time, feel free to raise your hand. Yes? Yeah. What if our goal is to walk through it? That's a good question. Is that saying the plan is still applicable, or should we wait until after our master? Great question. The question up here is, uh, what if your plans, what if your goals include getting a doctorate, which is phenomenal, and I, and I, I encourage you all to do that. That's a, a great, noble thing, and depending on your career path, if you want to get outside of the uh, public school education system, maybe uh, become a college professor someday, or even school administration, doctorates help toward that as well. That's a good goal. I would say it's still applicable, um, because you're not only can you get the district to pay for the master's, which you need first, but you're also collecting a salary. So not only are they paying for it, but you're also getting paid. So I would do that first. Then uh, some districts, like let's say you do five, six, seven years on the job, some districts will allow you time off to even go get your doctor. So again, if you can get somebody else to help you toward that goal, whether it be financially or time-wise, otherwise, I would still do that, yes, absolutely. And it's also giving you more experience out there too. So absolutely, great question. Yeah, absolutely, anything, yes. These are great questions. Yeah, I love it. Yeah, you guys brought the A game today. I love it. Uh, question is, what is the workload like when you're trying to do all that? Mike and I were just talking about this the other day, weren't we? Okay. Um, here's the good news, and I'm going to generalize uh, many of you here today. If you're in that college, so you're you're probably be between the ages of 20 and 25 would be most people here, right? So most of you are probably not married. You're probably not having your own kids at this point. Most of you could be differences, of course, but right now is the time when you can do all of those things. The workload is hard, don't get me wrong, um, especially if you're gonna be the, that passionate educator, that, that person that's involved and in there. Within my first two years of teaching at Leroy, I created three additional ensembles. Um, so you know, you're gonna be in there and you're not gonna be punching in at 7.30 and punching out at three. Okay, um, there are many, many days in my first two, three years, I was up at 5.30, I was in at six, you know, hour and a half before school, just getting all things done, figuring out your methods and how you're gonna do things and build a program if it needs building, which ours did at that time. Um, and then you're gonna be staying late. 
I remember many phone calls with my wife now, girlfriend then, uh, you know, hey, it's five o'clock, she's still working, I'm still working, okay, we'll meet later up at seven o'clock for dinner finally. So the workload's heavy. And now I did my master's at Fredonia as well. So that meant I'm working in Leroy, which is here in Rochester. Fredonia is an hour and a half away. So during the school year, I had to pick evening classes. And so I remember one of them in particular, one semester, and it was hard, it was a Wednesday night class from like seven to 9.30 or something. So one, I had to drive all the way down to Fredonia. And then two, I'm getting done at 9.30, 10 o'clock at night, and then I'm driving all the way back and I'm getting home at midnight or something like that. So taxing, yes, but staying up to midnight in your early 20s, not as hard as staying up to midnight now in my mid-40s, <laughs> although I still do it. But um, I would say it, it's, it's hard, but it's manageable, doable, succeedable, if that's a word, and you can do it now easier than when you've got the family and the kids and the other requirements. A great question, absolutely. Yes, yes, yes. You could do it through summer programs as well or with the uh, unfortunate emergence of COVID, a lot of things are online now. So there's even music online programs, which was not a thing 16 years ago when I was doing my masters. But yeah, you have online opportunities. So maybe you don't have to drive an hour and a half to Fredonia. Um, but also summer programs. I would do a lot of summer classes as well. And that's where I would kind of uh, load up and I'd go live at Fredonia for the month of July while I took bibliography or whatever uh, and, and all those other classes. Um, so yes, another question. I, I was just gonna ask, uh, do you have a That I don't know specifically because I don't have too much knowledge or experience with online coursework and classes and, and what that's exactly like. So that one, I can't tell you. I'll be honest, if I don't know something, I'll tell you. Yes. In my opinion, take that first year. You've got, for me it was, you had to get your master's within five years. Is it still five? Okay. I think it was seven to 10 years when I was starting off, but you've got five years to start or conclude that program. In my opinion, take that first year. Again, learn what your students need, what your programs need, what you need. Um, because another thing I was even considering was, well, I'll just go to SUNY Brockport, because again, Leroy was gonna reimburse at that rate. SUNY Brockport's in my backyard. I'll just go get a general ed degree, which would have worked. Which would have worked. Um, but ultimately, I decided to make the tra travel back and forth to Fredonia because it was going to be a better fit for, for my kids, my needs. Uh, but yeah, I would, I would say take, in my opinion, take a year, figure it out, um, and, and then go from there. Awesome. Yes? I did, yes. Good question. The question is, how closely related does your master's degree have to be to your subject field, right, to music? I, don't quote me on this. It would be actually maybe Mr. Koster knows better than I do, Dr. Koster knows. But uh, it, it doesn't have to be specifically in your music medium, correct? Uh, no. Um, can I take yeah, absolutely. This is a great question. Yes, teacher. This is Dr. Koster from Nazareth College. Everybody say hello. hello. It's good to see you all. I'm also the collegiate chair for this month, so it's good to see you all on behalf of this amazing presentation. But as far as certification goes, um, it can be related into any aspect of education, policy analysis, uh, a master's degree in, in inclusive education. It could be in creative arts therapy. It could be in conducting performance. It could be in music. And if you need a link afterwards, I can show you in a nice link where you can see any related area that would help you for this. Okay? Thank you all. Amazing right, presentations. Keep going. Thank you. Thank you. Awesome. All right. All right, well, uh, so, oh, where to work? Did this move on its own? Did I do that? You did it. Ooh, look at me. I'm fancy. Uh, <laughs> didn't remember. So uh, now the question is where to work. Larger districts, smaller districts, and I'll go back to what I said. You guys are graduating at a great time if you're, if you're still in college right now. There's many openings. There's many retirements, many openings, and not as many applicants. So you might literally get to be able to pick 
Um, when we were hiring a previous teacher one time, she was already one or two years into teaching at uh, School District A. But we, School District B, wanted to hire her. So here's the business side of things, as she should. Like, let's say it's Kodak versus Xerox. I'll be Rochester for a second, okay? If I'm working at Kodak and Xerox wants to poach me, right, I'm going to go back to Kodak and say, hey, they're going to steal me and they're offering me this package. What are you going to do to keep me or do I walk, right? And that's what any person would do outside of an educational field. We're not different. This is a school district. It's a business. You have a salary. You have your life and your family to support and things like that. So this person, and I, I agree with what she did, she went back to her school district and needed to tell them anyway, right? Hey, I just interviewed, they'd like, they're offering me a job, this is the package they put together for me, they're offering me step number whatever, that's contract terms, okay? Step what, whatever salary and X amount of sick days. And then that district, her current district, matched it and said, okay, we love you, we wanna keep you, um, we'll give you that plus an extra step or something like that. So then she went back to us, intelligently so and said okay they want to keep me is your offer still there or are, you, or are we doing something different and then our district said no we're, we're maxing out there and so we didn't get that individual but this is a business uh, my dad uh, loved that very wise man in my opinion he said kids are kids no matter what district you're in Okay, you're gonna have your curve of natural distribution of kids and you're gonna get connected to them. You're gonna get attached, you're gonna love your students, it's gonna be great, and if you don't, you shouldn't be in education, okay? So, but the kids in every district are gonna be the same, and if you're that passionate, awesome educator, it's not gonna matter if you're in one district or the other, you're gonna get connected to the kids. So, what my dad was saying was, don't take a job or keep a job for the kids specifically. It sounds harsh, doesn't it, okay? but take it for what fits you and what works with you, and in my opinion, who your team is. That's the biggest factor. If you're not enjoying who you work with on a daily basis, you're gonna be miserable. That's not a good way to be. I'm very, very fortunate. We have six people in our department, and this gets into what I was about to talk about here, large versus small. That's your call. I grew up in a larger district, Hilton. My wife teaches in Greece and has 20 some odd buildings. It's a massive district. You got giant districts all over the place. I teach now in a rural. We have about 1,200 students, 1,200 students, K-12. Okay, we only have six music faculty, but we get along famously. And that doesn't mean all the time. We don't agree. We're not the same six people. We will disagree with each other but we have mutual respect and work with each other and go for a common goal and end, and that's what makes a difference. We will have disagreements and we'll figure it out, um, and it's awesome. And I know many of my colleagues, musically in other districts, that that is not the case. And it's really funny if they're both in the same district talking about each other. <laughs> um, but, you know, that's important. So, you need to figure out what might fit you best. Are you from a large district and like that and want to be in a department of 20, 30 people? Are you from a smaller community and want to be back to that? Do you want us to experience the opposite of whatever you didn't or didn't have? All of those are going to be big factors. And all of them have different pros and cons. This is why there's no right or wrong answer. Okay, larger district is probably going to be in a more affluent area, maybe closer tied to a city, which means the taxes are going to be higher, which means your pay is going to be higher. My wife slaughters me in salary. I'll put it right out there. Okay, we survive on her, not me. It's cool. <laughs> All right, so that's fine. I that's that's cool, but she's not happy in her job. And if she was here, she wouldn't care that I said that. She'd say it herself. She's not happy in her job. She loves the kids. But there's all those other factors that she can't change that she doesn't like. So you have to figure that out for yourself. Larger district, yes, you, there's definitely gonna be more opportunity for money. There might be more opportunity for advancement within a department or something and move up the ranks to be a department chair or an admin or things like that. Small districts may not have those opportunities, probably won't have the salary associated with it, but everything in life is at trade-off and you need to figure out where you fit, what you're gonna want, and I'm not saying this is not bashing large districts, by the way, okay, not at all. Um, I had an opportunity to work at Hilton years ago and, um, and I highly, seriously considered taking it, okay? Ultimately, I didn't, because of my team, 
But um, think about that stuff, okay? There's, there's pros and cons to both small districts and large districts. Any questions? Yes. Do you have any tips on valuing our wealth here? Not wealth, valuing our, uh, like, what we're valued as a teacher, like going into the job of being one of the Sure. Like um, I, I, I think I get what you're getting at. Um, what you're, within the district, you mean? Yeah, like what, how do we make sure that we don't get Sure. Absolutely. So the biggest thing, actually this is going to be coming up on one of the slides, but I'll, I'll touch on it right now. The biggest thing is, and I learned this with unions and contracts that I did not think about. I graduated college, I'm like, job, 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 I just want to go teach. And I did. And I was like, oh, Leroy, they offered me a job. Cool. I'm in. Cool. I didn't ask questions in an interview, which is coming up next. I, did, I was just like, job, cool, sounds good. I, really, I know you, you know me, this is great, cool, we're doing it. I didn't ask any questions, anything about that. And for 12 years of my job, the first 12 years, I did a lot for free that I didn't realize I shouldn't be. And it was after conversation, like I would go to uh, solo festivals, I'd take my students to solo festivals. I didn't get paid for that. You should. That's your job and you're doing it outside of your school day. There should be a stipend or compensation. If you go supervise the boys' basketball game on Friday night, guess what, folks? You get paid, and that's in the contract. So you should get paid if you're supervising students at a music festival. Heck, you're actually doing work, not just standing watching a basketball game. For 12 years, I did not get a single dime for taking students to Solo Fest, for then accompanying my students to the All County that they made it in, or to go to the NISMA Solo Fest, and then to go to Area Allstate when they made it into that. I eventually total up those hours. I won't even give you the number, okay? So at the bare minimum, I should have been making my school district's contractually hourly, contractual hourly rate, minimal. But that's questions that you need to ask when you're getting hired. Or, you know, what's the district's stance on going to solo fests and doing these things? And is there compensation? And I never even thought about it. I was like, oh, it's my job, that's what I do. Just like I go do my evening concert which also could be arguably something you should be paid for because the math teacher doesn't give their final exam at the evening, does they do that, right? So we eventually went to our admin and said, hey, all of our colleagues in other districts are being paid for their evening concert, which is outside of the contractual school day. They're being paid for solo fest, paid for all kind, paid for this, and now we have that in our contract and we get compensation. Is it a ton of money? No. Is it something and I feel valued? Yes. Absolutely. Thank you. Yeah, absolutely. All right, there we go. Let's keep moving here. The interview. Again, when I was hired, I was just like, job, yeah, you go, okay? You should be asking questions, especially right now, because if you are going to be an outstanding educator, which you must be, you're here, you're already going above and beyond. You didn't have to be here today. You didn't have to be out here this weekend or tomorrow. So you're already caring enough to better your education by being here. That's cool. And never stop doing that, by the way. Again, I'm in my mid-40s. I'm still here, granted, because I'm talking right now. But I'm here all morning and all afternoon. I'm going to be back here tomorrow. I'm still learning things. I'm still picking things up. You know, it's I get a little bit more set in my ways with each passing year, but I still pick some things up. So never stop with that. Go to conferences. Go to sessions. Get out there and experience other things and learn. But anyway, here are some questions that, in my opinion, could or should be asked when you're interviewing for a position. Um, number one, what musical equipment would I have access to? If you're gonna be an uh, instrumental teacher or a string teacher or a vocal teacher or something like that, you know, what's the condition of the pianos? Are there pianos? Is it acoustic or is it electric? You know, uh, do I have brass instruments? What condition? Are they dented all beyond or are they usable and good? What's the repair budget for getting these things fixed on a daily basis? Speaking of budget, what would my budget look like? What, what, what do, and by the way, you can tell a lot on the support level of your admin based on the budget, okay? If they value your program, if they support your program, the money's going to follow because it's gonna take money to do a good program. Money to pay you for your time and your expertise and your teaching outside of the contractual day. Money to get the programs. I wanted to start an elementary marching band. It's pretty cool, I gotta say. So we have the mini marching nights. I love them. 
okay? Fifth and sixth grades, I know, they're as cute as they sound, all right? Um, they don't sound as cute, but no, it's cute. <laughs> no, they're good, they're good. Actually, her son's in it, um, so it's awesome. But I didn't, I can't just create a marching band, I need equipment. And I can't even just go use the marching band equipment from the high school, because one, the high school kids need it. Two, that would be hilarious, putting a full-size drum on a fifth grader. <laughs> right? That's not going to go well. So I needed to buy all new junior drums. That's thousands of dollars. I wanted a banner so we could go down the street and give credit to the school district and everything. So I went to my admin, they loved it. They're like, yes, I wrote the proposal, Board of Ed says yes, absolutely. And guess what? The money followed. And I was able to buy everything I needed. And I got a stipend. Now I get paid to do it. That's, so you need to advocate for those things. And because of that, we now have this really cool elementary marching band, which the kids love. And it's not even just for my regular band kids. I've got all these other kids that aren't bandos, but they come do the color guard stuff. And then that's feeding my high school marching band program, which is a competitive one, and that's great. Um, so yeah, what's your budget look like? Uh, computer hardware and software, right? Is there money for a finale? Because I'll tell you, if you're going to be a band teacher, course teacher, you're going to spend time on finale, sibelius, or whatever program you want. You're going to be writing and rearranging and changing parts. That's going to happen. I do tons of arranging. Um, the, you know, smart music. A, you know, is it Apple? Is it IBM? You know, everybody's got their preference and all that stuff. Um, this is. I should have asked this one. Where will I be teaching? My first year. <laughs> <laughs> my first year I was in the ticket booth of the auditorium awesome basically this little closet of space and I was teaching in the lobby of the auditorium which all hard surfaces so the brass lessons did sound awesome but anytime there was an assembly in that auditorium which for an elementary school you know once a week I'm out of a teaching space so I'm walking around the building trying to find a hallway corridor cafeteria closet whatever I can teach in now, I'm glad I didn't ask it because maybe at that time I would have been like, mm, maybe not. And I'm glad I didn't because I love the district, love where I've been. Um, but that's a question you need to ask. What's my space going to look like? Am I sharing a space with somebody else? Do I have a dedicated office or not? Is it, if it's general music, is there a classroom? Um, or am I pushing in and out of a band room or a chorus room? Right? That, those are big differences. Yes? Go for it. Great question. Yeah, okay, okay, yeah, yeah. Great questions were like, you know, how do you approach questions like this in an interview? Um, simple solution is don't be pretentious. Don't go in and be like, well, what's going to go? You know what I mean? So a lot of it's going to be body language and tact. Timing and tact. We could give a whole session on timing and tact. First student teacher I ever had. Came to band camp before his time with us was going to start in September. I'll get to your question, I swear. Um, but anyway, probably, probably was going to be a great student teacher. The keyword probably. Because I was immediately turned off from him because he came to our band camp, walked up to me on day one, barely had met each other, walks up and says, you know what you need to do? Bad tact. That could have been the most amazing advice in the world. My ears are closed. Done. So number one, it's going to be tact. Um, you need to read the room on your interview and how it's going. A lot of times, and I've been on many interviews, as Jackie pointed out the other day, I've hired every single one of the music department because I'm fairly old now. Um, we offer times for question, time for questions at the end of the interview. We say, uh, thank you very much. You answered our questions. This has been great. Do you have any questions for us? And at that time, that's when you can maybe hit on a couple of these ones. And maybe you choose from that list based on how the interview went. You know, what kind of feeling you got. Maybe the interview, like we would always do the interviews in our course and bandage, so you don't need to know about facilities that much. You know, you're sitting in them, things like that. Um, so you cherry pick from there. And then the last part of the question is, could you ask them there at the interview or maybe later on when you're about to sign a contract? Absolutely. I can't speak to every process, but most of the ones I've been involved with or know of have been a music department involvement with admin, then finalists go to a superintendent. 
So maybe some of these questions you wait for the superintendent round when it's basically down to you and somebody else. Yes. Uh, the, the question is, is there anything you should not say in an interview? I'm trying to think of bad interviews I've sat in on. I don't know. There's, there's not been anything that anybody said or asked in an interview that turned us off to that candidate. It's just been a general feeling of, of the person and just how they've been interviewing. And that doesn't even mean if they're like shy or shaky or nervous or something like that. Just, I don't know. It's, it's hard to put, hard to put a, a pin on that one. But I don't think there's anything that's off limits. Um, but obviously make it specific and pointed. I personally love it when uh, our people have come in uh, with questions during their interviews. I, I think that it shows me that there's interest, involvement, and, uh, and intelligence behind what they're looking for. And I think that's great. Similarly, when my kids go to Solo Fest, my professionals, uh, any, any professionals in the room, by the way? Yeah, all right. Two of us, three, four, five. So the six stroke roll could technically be performed four ways. Bounce first, tap first, right hand first, or left hand first. I teach my students when they go to solo fest that they are asked for that rudiment, which is almost a given uh, if it's a level five, six, to ask the adjudicator, you know, could you play the six stroke roll? Absolutely, would you like that bounce first, tap first, right hand first, or left hand first? If a kid does that to me, I'm an adjudicator. I mean, I'm like, I'm impressed. Kid knows the stuff, okay? so. I think there's, in my opinion, there's nothing that's off limits per se, but it's again, it's that timing and that tact. Absolutely. Um, really quickly, you've got the link, and I don't want, how are we doing on time? Like, where are we going? Three minutes left? Oh, okay. 11.27. Uh, yeah, we go to 11.45, right? Okay. Yeah. So, I wouldn't have been surprised if it was three minutes. <laughs> We're ordering dinosaur barbecue. I know the manager. Um, so, uh, let's see. So you can read through the rest of these, but daily schedule is going to be an important one. Uh, is your if you're doing an ensemble, is it before school, or after school, and if so, if there's a stipend or not? Like my elementary band meets before school, but I don't get a stipend for it because I follow the high school schedule, which is an hour earlier, even if I'm physically in the elementary school. But I've got friends that teach at Hilton. Their elementary bands are before school, and they, since they are contractually under the elementary schedule, and that elementary band happens before that contractual day, they get a stipend for that elementary band. Those are questions that you're going to want to know. Where is my ensemble? By the way, you can also tell if the district values their your program, your overall music program, based on where those ensembles are. Is there anything during the school day? That's a red flag if there's not. And I understand that you know administrators and stuff have to get 20,000 minutes of gym time to the kids and everything like that. I get that. But music's important too, obviously. That's why we're here. Um, so if nothing's during the school day, or oh, yeah, I know some programs where lessons aren't allowed, you get banned, but no lessons. Whew. Good luck building a program when you don't get one-on-one -on -one time with the kids. That's nearly impossible. So that's a good one. What's the daily schedule? Where are the ensembles? Things like that. Opportunity. Oh, I love this question. You asked if there's anything you shouldn't ask. Here's one you should ask. You know what administrators love right now? We have one in the back, and maybe he can verify or not. They listen, uh, Mr. Uh, Jeff Smith from Churchill Chile. Um, Mr. Smith, you've been on many interviews, obviously. Has anybody ever asked about activities and opportunities outside of that music department, ski club, coaching, things like that? Absolutely. That is exactly what I was going to say. And thank you. I appreciate that, Mr. Smith. Sorry to put you on the, uh, the uh, uh, spot there. But that's all. Like, I do the ski club, okay? How cool is that? A really expensive sport, and I don't have to pay for it. I get paid to go do it, all right? <laughs> and it offers me an opportunity to connect with the kids. I have met so many non-bandos, I like to call my kids the bandos, uh, because of ski club. It's an awesome opportunity. Um, if I wasn't running two marching bands, an elementary and a regular, I would totally coach tennis, bowling, 
uh, or baseball. I love those three sports. I'm really good at two of them. Um, so, um, you know, I would do those things if I had more time. But if somebody comes in asking those questions, that's huge. That's huge, because just like Mr. Smith said, you're showing interest outside of your own little pocket and corner of the educational world of the district. So that's huge. Um, be genuine, though. All of this needs to be genuine. Don't just ask questions, ask questions. You, you'll be seen through on that. Um, all right, you can keep looking at this stuff uh, and go through it, but we'll move on if that's okay. APPR at the bottom, by the way, that's your evaluation process. Every district's got a different process of how that works. We used to be two observations, one announced, one unannounced. Now it's just one unannounced. Um, so I can be teaching and they can come in, which I don't care. As I tell them, my door is always open, which let's go there for a second. Teach with your door open. Okay, unfortunately we live in a society, and if you know where I'm picking up on this stuff, there's, all it takes is an accusation and your career is done. My doors are always open. Every now and again, because it's elementary school, kids like to hug me, and I'm like, yeah, that's cool. <laughs> like, you know, so be careful with that stuff too, but your door is always open. And in terms of uh, observations, like my admin, hey, can I come in? Uh, I don't care. Come in, here's my schedule. Come in, I don't care. Come in the band, come into a lesson. You're gonna watch me teach it. Except for right now, you're gonna watch Mike teaching. <laughs> um, all right, let's move on. You landed your first job, congrats. Um, know your role within the department. Oh God, I can't, this is so important. Don't go in and try to change everything on day one because you think it needs to be changed. Number one, it probably doesn't need to be changed. You just think it needs to be changed because you've got your, your blinders on. And, and I speak from experience on that one, okay? Go in and be a chameleon. Blend with your department. See what's working. See what's not. Be a, um, a collegial colleague with your department members. Don't go in and try to you know change everything. I can give you two examples, and I won't because it'll take too much time, but in one district, two people both lasted up until spring break, and then they were out because they tried to change too much. Now, everything that they were changing, in my opinion, was for the better, and the program needed it, but they were both out by by spring break. And I told the second one, because of seeing what happened in the first one, I caught, I caught that person in like October, December, or whatever it was, and I was like, hey, don't do that. <laughs> do whatever they tell you. So I was talking to, to Mike and a couple people up front. Your district says jump, you say how high until you get tenure. Then you can do different things. And that sounds kind of crass, but it's true. If you don't have tenure, they don't need a reason to fire you. I saw that happen firsthand to a colleague my first year of teaching. Amazing course teacher who has since landed in a great job and we stay in touch and everything. But on a Friday, she didn't want to do the musical. They asked her to, to direct our musical. She didn't want to do that, okay? That's her prerogative, but it's the district's prerogative to say then you don't have a job anymore and she's not tenured. The union's not gonna back you, it's not gonna support you, it's not gonna help you. The district doesn't have to keep you if you're not tenured. So if they say, hey, we'd like you to do this, you say, okay, and then you do it, and who knows, maybe you end up loving it and you wanted to do it anyway or learn to love it, but if you don't, then after you get your tenure, don't sign up for that stipend again or whatever the thing is. But when you're not tenured, there doesn't need to be a reason. That's an important thing. Um, but going back to this, timing, tact, compromise. We, uh, uh, yes, hang on, let's hear. Time and tech compromise. Uh, again, we don't always agree as, as a team, but we will either figure out where we need to be or we will compromise to move forward. And that's super important. Uh, question in the back, yes. question is what if there's no set in stone curriculum? That's an awesome question. We really didn't have a curriculum for a long time. That's where you go to like somebody like Mr. Smith, a fine arts administrator or your principal, uh, and but probably start with your colleagues, I should say that. Some of your colleagues say, hey, do we have anything written down? Because maybe there is one that's sitting on a shelf, you know, needs to be dusted off. But if there's not, maybe you and your colleagues approach the admin. I know our admin love curriculum writing. Every, every June, they're like, hey, any teams want to get in and revise or redo their curriculums? and they will pay you for that because that's coming in over the summer out of your contract time to pay you to develop, revisit, and redo that curriculum. So yeah, and that's, a curriculum's an important thing, you know? Um, 
Seems kind of silly, but be nice. All right? Don't, how do we say it? Like, I, I don't, I, we're always nice with each other, but that's not what I've seen. I, I, I've, I've literally seen colleagues, people that are supposed to be working together for the benefit of the same students at odds with each other, sometimes in front of the students. Awkward. I mean, just be nice. Please be nice. Yes. Sure, you're gonna incorporate some change because you are you and you're not whoever you're replacing. But try to work, make the changes small, spread them out, and test the waters as best you can. The people I was talking about, the two examples, they came in, and in my opinion, the program had a lot of things wrong with it. Like, kids didn't have to come to lessons, you just get a 100. That's a problem for me. Um, but you can't start failing kids left and right when the expectation for the last however many years was not that. That's gonna land you in trouble. You can you know, just try to impress upon the kids the importance of coming to the lesson first. After you've built that, maybe slide in the grading and stuff like that. Or don't be as harsh right away. Yes? Uh, so you mentioned that after you're Great question. Yeah, question about not getting burnt out early on and taking on too much. Absolutely. Um, it can be overwhelming, and I'm talking, I'm giving you guys so much information today, and we're like two slides in or whatever it is. Um, so yeah, it, it can be overwhelming, and, and certainly burnout and fatigue is a thing. Um, one thing, so for me personally, I happen to be a high energy type of person. So burnout has never really been a thing for me so much, but I do make sure to take time to do the things that I want to do as well, and I've always done that. So right now, as a dad and a husband, it's taking more time with my family whenever I can, um, and, and I make times. Uh, I am being asked of my time left and right, come play with this group, come play this, come do that, and, and I, I have learned, and I know it's kind of the cliche, but I've learned to say no. Uh, as much as I want to go do things like I used to play in the music educator wind ensemble and technically my if they practice on Sunday nights here in Rochester It's a great group. Love it. Uh, Bill Tiberia phenomenal conductor musician if you don't know who that guy is um, And my Sunday nights are free right now But they're free and it's one of the only nights that I'm free. So that's my night to be at home with my family uh, So I'm not playing with them this year as much as I could or would or would want to or they would want me to so yeah, you do need to find time for yourself, uh, whether to, to fill your cup and all those things, right? Whether it's as a performer or family or hanging out with your friends, certainly do that. Make your job, of all the things you do that are you're required to do, just make sure your job comes first. No matter what, I, as I've mentioned, I'm an adjudicator, I perform, I write music, I do the blah, blah, blah. I wear all these hats as you all will and probably already all do, okay? But I make sure my job job comes first. My Leroy students come first. Um, that then the other things, but yeah, that's, yeah. You just need to find out where your boundaries are. And there was, I'll tell you, last December, and I'm still learning, right? So last December, a year ago, I got burnt out. Uh, because I did choose too much. I was playing, God, I don't know how many Christmas services and all this music, and I had to write it, I had to transcribe it. Like, I got overwhelmed, um, and it was not fun. And I still did all the commitments, but physically it literally took a toll on my body, not to sound weird or cliche, but um, it, I was done, I was done. And thank God Christmas break then came up because I needed that time, so yeah. Um, union. Know your union. How many of you know that that's a thing, that you go to a district's union? Good, cool, some of you, that's good. I did not. I'm like, I get a job, cool, superintendent's my boss. Nope, union, union's kind of your boss. So my first year, I'm teaching, I get the assistant director stipend for marching band, I'm the assistant director, and it's like half, not even, it's not even half of what the director makes, and we're basically doing the same job. 
It's also not even closely in line with what an assistant varsity coach makes. And it should be, because marching band is a varsity sport. I will argue that to the end of the year. We probably spend more time than varsity sports do. Um, so I went to my superintendent, and I brokered a deal with her, and she increased my stipend. Nope. That's how it went, and then the union found out, and I got destroyed. My union president came to me, how dare you? We are the sole negotiating body for the union members. You do not have any right. I got lit up. So if you ever have a grievance, question, or concern, it's not your, and it's contractual in nature, like a stipend, or salary, or hours, or what you're being asked to do, that is a union question. You go to your union rep, your union officers. Unless you want to get yelled at like I did. And then guess what? I didn't get that increase in my stipend. Because the union's like, no, we're not going to go do that for you. Nope. You went behind our backs. We're not happy about it. Nope. I eventually got it because they redid the whole contract and all that good stuff. But know your union. What's that? Five minutes? Awesome. Thank you. School business and community business. I can't tell you how important it is, especially if you do get into the smaller, more rural districts. You need to make connections within your community. That's the businesses and the restaurants. Um, and you need to be genuine about it. Um, I frequent the restaurants in Leroy because I like food and they have good food. And they're good people. And then when I want something, like let's say we're gonna host a show and I want program sponsors, guess what? They're more apt to do that for us. We use several of the local pizza places. We buy pizza for the kids all the time. And the pizza places give us a deal, and then it's that reciprocal relationship. We have a company, LP Graphics. Um, I do all sorts of swag for my kids. T-shirts and, you know, uh, I do cinch bags, draw bags for my percussionists for them to be able to bring that. It's embroidered with their name on it. The district pays for all of them, and it's so awesome because one, I've created a lasting relationship with that business whose grandkids I've taught, all right? Secondly, in terms of the swag and stuff like that, you're building up an identity for your kids in your program. They wear those band shirts around all the time. I started with 50 kids in my band. I'm up to 80 right now. That's, that's a big improvement in 20 years, honestly. And going through COVID, when other programs got slaughtered, and now I'm at 80. And it's little things like that. Yeah, it's the music and me and we're playing and we're doing all this stuff, but there's also identity and ownership and value through doing things like t-shirts and bags or whatever, hats, whatever we do. Um, but build those relationships. It doesn't mean only that, by the way. I'll still buy my percussion stuff at Steve Weiss. It's in Pennsylvania. Um, we do a lot of business with music and arts, which is the biggest national chain. Okay, if I have to do that, I'm gonna do that because I still wanna be fiscally responsible with the money in my budget to be able to maximize what I can get for my kids. But if I can do something local, which I do 80% of the time, then I do that. Time to teach. Organization is the key to success. I can't stress that enough. You wanna talk about burnout? You're gonna get burned out if you're disorganized. Organize your life, organize your school life. That means knowing your inventories, score, study, and prep. Oh, there is nothing more anxiety, uh, whatever the word would be, I'm at a loss right now, causing, inducing, than showing up to a rehearsal unprepared. Now, you probably already know that just as a player in an ensemble, because we've all shown up unprepared to a rehearsal. And that, the anxiety, right? Please don't notice me, please don't notice me, right? Okay? So, and as a percussionist, you're gonna get noticed because you're the only one playing the part. Might be able to hide in a other section, but anyway, same thing. Don't show up unprepared for your kids. Have your scores studied and know what you wanna do. We're talking about that all the time, right? Okay, you're gonna be more effective, you're gonna get more out of those kids. Have your stuff together, so be organized. I'm gonna kinda rush through things here. Percussion, I talk about that a lot, obviously, right? Um, this is a one. How many of you future band directors or current band directors? Any bandos? Cool. All right. In my opinion, that being on the podium is your signal to the band that you're ready to go. Off the podium, their time. So you finished rehearsing a piece. You're going to get, you're okay, now we're going to put that away. We're going to get out the next piece. You get off the podium to allow them that time. Now is when you watch your percussion section. 
wind players, all you do is turn a page, you're ready to play the next piece of music. Percussion's gotta go from one end of the band to the other end of the band, and put this away, get this, blah, 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 blah. So watch them and wait for them. When they're ready, then you can get back on that podium, okay? That's that's the, now, at the same time, if they're fooling around back there, then you gotta address that and all that stuff. But give your percussionist time, and you'll be ready. And by the way, your ensemble will love you for that, and your percussionist will love you for that. And if your percussion section's solid, your band is solid, plain and simple. If your percussion's a mess, your ensemble has no chance. They're driving the bus. I always tell them, they have more power than I do as a conductor. The band listens and follows them, they don't follow me. All right, like down. Okay, all right, we're basically out of time. Um, I know, isn't that crazy? Oh, I got a good meme, what was that one? Oh, Destiny's Child, say my name, say my name. That's 1990s, anybody, Destiny's Child? Yeah, all right, I'm still somewhat relevant, sweet. Um, we are out of time. I will gladly stay up here and, and, and answer any questions. I've got hard copies if you want to take one of these. You guys have been fantastic. Thank you. Um, yeah, yeah, thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Oh, a certificate. Wow. Yeah. There we go. I can prove to my district that I was here. Yes. This is for one more round of applause. Great. Yeah, if you'd like a hard copy, please come grab one. If you want any other questions or anything, I'll stay right here. Okay, here we go. Lovely. Thank you.